All right. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to present this work. Um, as Francesco said, joined with uh, Mike Ting from Colombia, who is um, also on the chat today. Um, and it is um, a paper about organizational capacity and project dynamics um, motivated by our mutual interest in bureaucratic organizations and their capacity as uh, crucial elements for the outcome of government policies in modern society. Translating statuses into on the ground results requires a massive bureaucratic machinery and a rapidly emerging focus for scholars and practitioners is the idea of organizational capacity. Particularly what we mean by that is what features of bureaucracies are consequential in the delivery of public outcomes? And what does that imply for which policies are implemented and how? Now, when we talk about organizational capacity, um, there are uh, no set um, ways in which this is modeled in political economy or not set definition of what capacity or organizational capacity is. And different people have taken different approaching, approaches to integrating this into models of political economy. And uh, in particular, we can uh, categorize these different approaches, broadly speaking, as taking one of two uh, ways uh, of modeling capacity. Although these ways are not mutually exclusive, one is to think of capacity as an input, usually human capital, uh, having a higher quality bureaucrats or more expertise in the bureaucracy, which allows you to deliver a better quality policies. Another way to think about it is capacity as augmenting familiar parameters of political economy models um, of the standard ways in which we think in political economy as um, having the production function for public goods or public policies. So that is affecting the costs of uh, delivery, the valence or the variance of policy. Now, whether you take the first or the second approach to thinking about capacity, in both cases, capacity constrains what policies a politician can choose. And so what we want to do in this project is to start from this observation that these ways of looking at capacity both go towards this constraint on what a politician can uh, do and therefore condense these different views of capacity to their core implication, which is that agencies with higher capacity are more likely to achieve uh, bureaucratic tasks. Um, whether it is due to human capital or lower cost, uh, the outcome is the same. And so in this model, so we're, we're, going, in progress. we're going to um, collapse capacity to a one parameter that indicates how fast a project is moving along. Capacity is then going to affect the political process because it determines whether political actors mobilize to change policy. Um, in particular, in our model, control over policy is going to change over time. And once it changes, it can trigger revisions to ongoing projects by uh, the new politicians who come into power. This threat of new politicians coming in, opposition mobilization to change projects is going to affect how these projects are set up in the first place. It's going to affect the size and the scope of projects um, that are going to be changed in anticipation of such potential revisions along the way. And so the outcomes of public policies are going to be endogenous to institutional capacity and to the political process. And so what we want to do in this project is to link capacity to these characteristics of projects, whether so it's their size, their timing, their cost, um, and so on. 
Now, to give you a, a more applied example of what we mean by public projects, consider the um, example of an infrastructure project as kind of your running um, example of, of what we mean by a project here. Uh, in the United States, for example, uh, this is a non-trivial um, amount of public funds that goes towards uh, infrastructure pro projects like public transportation. Uh, for example, this capital investment grant administers about $2 billion in a year in, in uh, funds for, for public transportation. And these public transportation projects are usually multi-stage, uh, long, um, time-wise long projects, and uh, they usually require multiple stages of approval, in this case two stages, development and then engineering, and each stage can be lengthy, um, and because it's lengthy, it is exposed to uh, transitions in political power, which can then give rise to uh, delays, reassignment of objectives, different revisions by the new administration, and so on which of course can then delay this even longer. Uh, for example, uh, one such project um, was the New York, uh, New Jersey Gateway Program, which was started in 2011. And it's long enough that it has gone through three different administrations so far, um, started under Obama, then frozen under Trump, and now uh, restarted under Biden. Um, and to, to get a sense of how big and visible these projects are, here's a picture of the, the New York, New Jersey Gateway Program. Um, and as this is something that Mike is very familiar with living in New York, um, I uh, when we started talking about this project, um, I could sympathize um, on how it is or how, how long it takes for public projects to, to be finished in the United States, living in San Francisco right next to the Van Ness bus line, which has been almost a 20 year project. Um, and as this tweet shows, when you compare it to private projects, the timelines can be quite larger um, in the public sector. So now I'm going to skip over the related literature in the interest of, of time, uh, but I'm happy to go back to it at the end in the discussion. Then let me go into the model. And um, what we have is an environment with two politicians, A and B, and discrete time going from zero to whenever uh, the game ends. The game will start with the politician A in power at time zero. This politician in power can initiate a public project that will be described in a second. The project begins in period one, and it may only be completed after undergoing a set of bureaucratic hurdles. That means that this project lasts at least two periods before it's completed, maybe many more periods than that. In terms um, of the political side, there's transitions in power that can occur every period. And once a new politician comes in, they may modify the project um, in that period. And the game will end when the project is completed. So that's kind of the general setup. And now let me go uh, step by step through it. Can I, can I ask here a uh, fine question? So in projects like that, there is this uh, ongoing discussion about NIMBYism and NIMBYism. Uh, so is this is this anywhere in the picture here? This is not the, the opposition, or is this a, a, an opposition party? And the second question, is this an exogenous thing, if, if you were to include that? Or, or is it, in fact, endogenous? So uh, what we have in mind was um, exactly starting from that idea of, of these entry points for people to contest pro uh, projects and therefore to uh, delay them or ask for revisions to them or changes to them, which relates very much to this idea of, of NIMBYism. Um, what we do here is to integrate that into a, a model where uh, these organizations would have to act through the politician in power. So they cannot change a project unless they're a uh, politician comes in and 
and facilitates that process. Um, so rather than thinking about politician A and B, you can think about two groups A and B. Uh, and and if at some every period, nature gives the possibility to one of these groups to make changes. Um, and so we can map it into that. Um, and, and but as you'll see in a second, the reason why we wanted to focus on politicians is to think about this, this strategic aspect of how you design projects at the beginning. Thanks. Um, all right, so what are these multi-stage public projects? Um, a project is going to be characterized by three attributes. One is the total value that is produced per unit. That's going to be some V. And the second is the scale of production. That's the, the amount of investment, S. And then three is going to be how this benefit is divided among the two parties. Uh, there's going to be some project division, W, um, for without loss of generality, assume W is greater than or equal to a half. So a fraction W will go to one politician, the other remaining one minus W will go to the other politician, um, as I'll explain uh, shortly how this, uh, could, how is decided which politician gets W versus one minus W. To reach completion, this project must undergo two stages, development and execution. Now, moving from development to execution happens with probability P each period. So this probability P is that one parameter to which we collapse the idea of capacity. And we think about capacity, therefore, as the technology needed to move this project forward from the D stage, the development stage, to the execution stage. Um, now, in terms of payoffs and costs, uh, if completed, the project therefore will produce a total output of V times S. And this output may be divided in one of two ways, given this W. Either A gets W or B gets W. So if A gets W, then we say that the project is of type WA. So it favors politician A because politician A gets at least half of the output. If it favors politician B, we call the project of type WB because now W goes to the politician B. So A gets less than half of the uh, benefits. Running the project costs something. So per period, running costs are two times S squared, uh, which uh, are divided equally among the two politicians. So each politician pays S squared every single period that the project is still in the development stage. And we assume no discounting uh, in the model. So that means that if I have a project of type WI, Politician I is going to get the benefit V times S times W, W of the total of produced output, minus S squared times the number of periods that it takes to end this project, to complete this project, which is uh, which we denote here by T. Um, importantly, you don't get the benefit from the project until it is completed, but you pay this running cost every single period up until you reach completion. And now what about these power transitions and revisions? Um, so with, we assume that with probability RA, politician A gets to be in power next period. With probability one minus A, one minus RA, politician B gets to be in power. So each period from one onwards, the politician in power decides whether to continue the project, the current project, or to revise it. If you continue the project, the project moves forward with probability P as described before, that's given by the capacity of the bureaucracy to move forward the, the hurdles and, and finish the project. If you decide to revise, then what happens is that the project cannot move forward in the current period. It stalls for the current period. And with probability Q, your revision is successful and the project type changes from WI to WJ. So if it favored A, now it favors B. If it favored B, now it favors A. And with probability one minus Q, 
the revision fails and therefore the project type doesn't change and we start the next period with the same project type in the same stage. This parameter Q measures the success probability of a revision, which uh, in reduced form captures the idea of how powerful regulatory review is, how powerful litigation is, or the judicial system in changing uh, the characteristics of projects. These other veto players, as Max mentioned, NIMBY groups and whatnot, what is their power to come in and uh, successfully change a project, or how much discretion has this current uh, person in control and to change the project. So to recap, what we have is the following timing in this model. In period zero, politician A is in power and she's going to choose the scale of the, the project and this division W. In periods one until project completion, with probability RA, politician A is in power Otherwise, B is in power. The politician in power chooses whether to continue or revise. If a revision is triggered, the project stalls for that period. And if the revision is successful, it changes type. If continued, the project moves forward with probability P. And each politician pays the running cost for that period, which is S squared. And then once the project reaches stage E, that's when it is completed and the payoffs are realized in terms of the benefits um, according to this payoff division in place and the project type in place. In terms of equilibrium concept, we're going to look at the mark of perfect equilibria of this game where at every period T equal to one onwards, there's a project stage that the, current, the project currently is in, whether it's development or execution. There's a politician in power, whether it's A or B. And there's a current project type, WA or WB. Whereas at time zero, we just have politician A as the politician in power. And therefore, from time one onwards, the politician in power decides whether to revise or continue. So what we're looking at is a revision probability, which we denote by sigma i for politician i, that's going to depend on the current project type w um, at time t. I'm sorry, can I ask a question? Dana, how are you doing? Hi, um, how are you? A, um, how should we think about um, um, this running cost being borne by both politicians, whether they're in power or not, is that a key assumption? Uh, so, yeah. So, if I'm not in power as a politician, I'm still bearing the cost of this. How should I think of that? Yeah, yeah. No, thank you for that question. We're thinking about the project running costs as essentially being the government budget that is dedicated to this project. So, the taxpayer money that is being used to run this project. And that's why we assume that it's shared by everyone in that even if I come into power and, you know, I'm, I'm inheriting this project that you started last period, well, now um, the budget, there's a budget allocation for it that is ongoing until the project is completed. And so that constrains me as the new politician in that I cannot use those funds for anything else. And so I'm also paying the cost. Um, in a very kind of the most simplistic way, we're thinking about it as just taxpayer money that therefore every taxpayer uh, has to pay for this for this project to keep running. Uh, it's in, including my electoral base and your electoral base. Um, so that's how that's why we're thinking about it as being split. So, so but I mean, it, another, it seems like you're not splitting the way you're describing. You, you're splitting every period regardless whether I'm in power or not, as opposed to splitting in the sense it's born all by whoever is in power at that moment and none by who's not in power at that moment. Yes, exactly, exactly. Because we wanted, the, the what we had in mind was this idea of, of the tax base. So 
you are it's split by everyone because it's essentially saying the taxpayer is all the taxpayers are, are paying this cost um, so there's no way to to isolate the taxpayers who are the voters for the party in power from the taxpayers who are the voters for the party out of power so all the voters have to pay uh, the cost all the taxpayers have to pay the cost and so um, that's why that's why everyone is is um, kind of paying it and so yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, everyone. yeah <laughs> but it's the guy. Yeah, I understand the taxpayers are borrowing the cost, but then it's the guy in power that sees, you know, its budget. If there is such a budget, it seems you have a soft budget because you you model as a cost, mm -hmm. uh, not as a tight budget. But it seems like it's the guy in power that sees its budget restricted if he wants to you have other uses for it. Um, yeah, that's all. It's no, that's the other point for sure. And and like this was just a, a, a kind of a simplification assumption that um, we can generalize because what we're doing here is we're saying we're choosing this division of the benefits. So I'm I'm choosing how much of this project's benefits I get relative to you. And so we could have the alternative where we're actually um, dividing costs unequally. And so the guy in power maybe gets a higher cost than, than the guy out of power. Um, the whole, the, the, what we care about at the end of the day is going to be how much of this project's outcome benefit I get relative to how much I pay for it. Um, and one simplification is to assume everyone pays the same, but then everyone gets different shares of the, the actual product. product. Um, versus assuming that maybe the product division is fixed and then we, we kind of can operate and change the, the cost dimension. Uh, but in the end, it's all about this relative benefit to cost. Um, so we can discuss at the end if, um, if uh, yeah. how Fine. we can Thanks. think about it, because I think it's a good point of like, we can tell different stories of how this division, this division works. So we went with this story for now. Um, and so as I was saying, Dana, sorry, very two very quick things. One is is E uh, when E is, is that random or is it known at the beginning of a project? Oh, I'm so E is that. the stage, the execution stage. So, so it's, it's chosen. So that's known. So it's basically the, the end stage. So everyone knows when the end stage is reached. Um, right. So it's, but it's not a choice variable. It's exogenous. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a choice variable. It's a state. Okay, yeah, and it's the, completely second, exogenous. the second is more of a comment than a question. So it's interesting that you're not allowing uh, when somebody chooses to change the project to choose the W again. So it's so basically, if I chose a, a W that's very much in my favor and I lose power automatically, I actually that project becomes very much against me, right? Yeah. I get very yeah. little. Yeah. Uh, so maybe. Uh, uh, don't answer me now, but maybe we should discuss this later because it seems to be uh, an important assumption. Absolutely, and yes, I will. I will defer that to the end because I think we can we can discuss how how we can why we thought about it this way. But obviously, it was a, a an important element of kind of adding a constraint here to how much freedom politicians have to change to change projects. Um, but yes, absolutely. Then this is going to drive a lot of of the the tension here. Um, and then, um, so given uh, this choice, the, the probability of revision sigma, the politician is going to choose um, the sigma to best respond um, and maximize expected net gains, uh, which is expected payoff from this project minus expected running costs. And again, there's no discounting. Okay, so now let me give you uh, two quick benchmarks before we go into uh, the solution to this. Um, the first benchmark is that of thinking of what is the optimal thing here that a social planner would do. And particularly notice that we have these two frictions in the model. One is this unequal division of benefits, which also, as Francesco pointed out, is fixed at the beginning uh, through this W. Um, and it doesn't have to be equal to what the other person gets. And then we have this power transitions, the fact that you can have a politician come in and revise. So consider first the, the solution without these frictions. And in that case, a planner just chooses the scale S to maximize the total expected net value of the project. And she splits this net um, value or she splits the cost um, and the value equally among the two politicians. 
Um, and therefore, in this case, when you're just choosing the scale and W is going to be a half, um, capacity P is the only relevant issue here because capacity, so higher capacity, is going to lower the expected time to completion and also the variance in, in time to completion. So let this T of P denote the expected duration of the project. In that case, the planner's problem is just going to be to maximize the total produced, which is V times S minus the cost of producing that, which is the expected number of periods it takes to finish, uh, times the cost, the running cost, which is two times S squared, leading to a social planner's optimal scale of VP over four here. And also noting that without revisions, the with the probability P of moving forward, the expected time to completion is one over P. Now, what happens if we add in the friction of unequal division of payoffs, but keep um, away from the transitions in power and revisions. So we have politician A being essentially a dictator who chooses the project and runs it. In that case, the only uh, relevant issues are the capacity and how much of this division of benefits will politician A uh, set for herself. As before, with no revisions, time to completion is one over P. Given that politician A is a dictator and runs this project until completion, she will get she will want to get all of the benefits from it, so she will set W equal to one, um, and therefore she will maximize the total output minus her running cost, which is only half of the total running cost, which means that the scale in this benchmark is going to be double what uh, it was for the social plan. Okay, so now, um, of course, um, higher capacity is going to uh, facilitate uh, a higher scale um, in both cases. So now what happens when we add power transitions um, and we go to our model? These transitions add the possibility of revisions. So they add a potentially lengthier time to completion for the project. And this is going to act towards decreasing the scale because the lengthier you expect the project duration to be, the more cost you expect to pay for everyone. Um, and so the other element, though, is that once we have this threat of revisions because of transitions, this is a threat of lower payoff for the politician A if the project changes from uh, from type A to type B. And so the politician uh, that stars politician A is going to strategically increase S in order to discourage revision or will want to strategically discourage um, revision to increases in scale. So these two forces, one pushes us down due to the cost, another one pushes us up due to the incentive of politician A to try to discourage politician B from stalling the project in order to revise it. So this equilibrium scale may be higher or lower than in the benchmarks. Another way for um, revisions to be discouraged could be through revising the division of benefits or through changing the division of benefits initially. So W may also be uh, changed to discourage revisions. And what we want to see is how does capacity affect these equilibrium values? And how does the ease of successfully revising, which is our Q, affect these equilibrium values? So what we're going to do is take this and solve it moving backwards. So first, given a particular uh, scale and division of benefits, we want to understand what are the optimal revision strategies, A and B. Um, and of course, note uh, sigma A and sigma B, noting that a politician will only go and do a revision if the current project, when they come into power, is the one that doesn't favor them. If the project favors them, then they would never um, want to revise it because there's no gain from doing so. So for simplicity, we're going to call sigma A the probability that politician A revises a B-type project, and sigma B the probability that politician B revises an A-type project. After we have this equilibrium, um, once S and W are set, then we can uh, compute the expected utility for politician A at time zero, and therefore derive the optimal S and W and then understand how they change with P and, and Q. 
So for the step one, once S and W are set, the game from period one onwards can be represented as a Markov process. We only have here six states, where a state is, is denoted by um, the stage, whether it's development or execution, which is um, exogenously given, um, and it depends on whether the project has moved from, from D to E. Um, we have the politician in power, who can be A or B, and then we have the project type, WA or WB. And so if we start from um, any of these stages, um, the probability of moving to another any one of other stages is given, uh, given the parameter, the exogenous parameters of the model. So if you start with politician A in power project A, with probability RA, politician A stays in power, and the project remains in stage D if it hasn't moved to E, which happens with probability 1 minus P. If it moves to E, which happens with probability P, then the project is completed and the benefits are, are given. How, with probability 1 minus RA, pro, 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 politician A loses power, a politician B comes in, and uh, with probability 1 minus P, the project stays in the development stage. Um, so, and no other uh, state can be reached from, from this stage D, A, uh, W, A. If we have a project that is a different type than the politician in power, as it is in the case of politician A, project B, then politician A revises with probability sigma A, which means that if a revision is triggered and it is successful, which is with probability Q, and politician A stays in power, probability RA, then we move from stage DAWB to stage DAWA. And a project will stay in the current state if either it is uh, revised but unsuccessfully, which happens with probability 1 minus Q, and the politician, the same politician stays in power, or if it's not revised, which happens with probability 1 minus sigma A, um, and it doesn't move forward um, with probability 1 minus P, and the same politician stays in power. And so on, we can, we can therefore uh, compute uh, these transitions from one stage to another. And we can use this Markov process, um, which uh, finally notice that the end stages here are the execution stages. So you either execute the type A project or a type B project. And once you've reached execution, you're done, the game ends. And we can use this Markov transition probabilities to compute, therefore, the expected probability of each reaching execution with project A, of reaching execution with project B, and also the expected time to completion um, for each um, project uh, type, given, uh, again, the, the strategies of the players. So we can compute, therefore, the utility for each of the, the expected utilities for each of the players which is going to be that you get payoff W if your project is completed, payoff 1 minus W if the other person's project favoring the other person is completed, and everyone pays this cost of running the project for the number of periods expected. So now, given this expected utilities, we can solve for what are the equilibrium sigma A and sigma B. And that gives us this first result that um, there exist these three uh, um, thresholds, S1, S2, and S3, such that in any period greater than or equal to 1, if the scale is very small, is below S1, everyone is going to revise. If the scale is between this S1 and S2, only the um, advantaged, transition advantaged party is going to revise. So that's A if the RA is greater than a half, or B is more advantaged to stay in power if R is less than a half. If S is between S2 and S3, then we're going to have multiplicity where either you have one party revising and the other one not, or you have, because both of these equilibria in, exist in pure strategy, you also have a mixing equilibrium. And finally, if S is greater than some S3, then nobody revises. So to show this graphically, um, the idea here is that in the left panel, I have the graph for when RA is greater than a half, in the right panel when, where RA is less than a half. And um, on the x-axis is the scale, on the y-axis um, the, the, the sigma, the probability of revision. Um, in dashed lines for A and in solid lines for B. And what we see is that as scale increases, this running costs of the project increase for both players. So both players are less willing to revise, all, all else equal. 
However, um, if the scale is small, so in the region depicted here by uh, with orange, um, everyone wants to revise. The, the, the cost is small for everyone, regardless of what the other party is doing. At some point, the, the electorally disadvantaged party drops out of revising because their relative gain compared to the cost of running the project is, is lower. So they want to, to stop paying this running cost uh, sooner than the party that is advantaged. And so we have this equilibrium and only one party revises and the other one doesn't. When S is intermediate, we have the region of multiplicity because now the uh, cost of running the project relative to the benefit of uh, finishing it depends on what the other party is doing. If the other party is not revising, then the running cost expected uh, from this project is sufficiently low that I want to revise. However, if I know that the other part is revising, I expect this long running cost because of them stalling the project. So I don't want to revise. The cost is too high for relative to my benefit. So that's why we have this equilibrium where only one party will revise and the other one won't. And as these two equilibria exist, the mixing between them also exists. And the mixing is depicted in the blue um, lines here. Um, and what flips when we when we go to the electorally disadvantaged party being A is, of course, that B is the one who continues revising for a little longer. Um, so now what this tells us, therefore, is that one, we have this uniqueness of equilibrium, except for that intermediate region where there's multiplicity. We're going to focus on, on robust comparative statics. Um, and when we have to select an equilibrium, we're going to, for now, I'm going to show you what happens if we select the ones where um, the equilibrium that advantages the uh, party that is electorally advantaged. So we continue with the same pure strategy equilibrium as in the previous region, uh, which means that essentially here, um, if A is advantaged, we continue with A being the only one that revises until, until A also drops out. Um, and if B is advantaged, we, can, we, we have in the middle of the equilibrium where only B revises and A doesn't. Um, and what we notice here is that there is this cost effect of scale, right? Like higher scale, lower probability of revisions. But also there is this payoff effect of revisions, which is that the advantaged politicians want to revise for longer, for higher scales than the other politician. And so in this partial equilibrium, um, the capacity P is going to increase the probability of revisions because the capacity P is going to push these thresholds to the right, is going to make the running cost, the expected running cost lower, and so it's going to encourage more revisions. But now let's look at what happens, given this, how this influences what happens at the beginning uh, with how S and W are chosen. In period zero, the politician uh, A, the politician in power, is going to choose S and W. It's going to maximize her expected utility given S and W. Um, and now what we show is that this expected utility can be collapsed to something like this. And now these deltas are just expressions of given the strategies sigma a and sigma b um, and parameters of the model. Uh, but what we want to show with this is that the expected utility is going to be con piecewise concave in S for the pure strategy equilibria. It could be concave, uh, convex for the mixing and increasing. Um, and is going to be piecewise linear in W. And this therefore makes the problem relatively um, uh, easy to, to think through um, once we uh, get into period zero. In particular, this is the graph of the um, utility, expected utility um, as a function of W. So it's piecewise linear in W. Um, and you see here the region of multiplicity. The green line is kind of the equilibrium that we select in the multiplicity region, um, and it's otherwise unique outside of it. And what we note with uh, these panels, which again are like left is A is advantaged, right is B is advantaged, is that, um, and we show in the paper, is that we only have a discontinuity in this linear uh, utility function at the point at which B is going to start revising. So at the point at which the equilibrium changes from the one in which either uh, no one or just A revises to the equilibrium where B revises as well. Um, 
and um, here um, in, is the same the same idea. And so that means that the equilibrium W can either be the one here at this boundary between the equilibrium where B doesn't revise and, and the one where B revises, or it's at one. Um, so that gives us uh, an easy thing to check in terms of W. And now given the expression W of S that we get from, from that uh, previous analysis, we can plug that into the expected utility and, and find the uh, optimal S uh, for the uh, politician A. And we, what we can show with this is that the optimal S, once we have this optimal W pin down, can only be in the region, either on the boundary between the regions where A, only one politician revises and the other one doesn't, or in the region where nobody revises. Um, and um, that also then gives us the equilibrium uh, revision uh, down, the, uh, down the path, as well as the, the equilibrium scale. And in particular, what it gives us once we um, kind of show the expressions for uh, S and W is that this is the main, the main result that there's no revisions on the equilibrium path um, and that the equilibrium project type, therefore, that's going to end is going to be WA. And the equilibrium scale and payoff divisions are going to be as follows. Now, if P is greater than 2Q, we're going to be in the unconstrained capacity regime in which um, w is equal to 1 and s star is equal to vp over 2, which is actually the same uh, outcome as in the benchmark with no power transitions. That's why it's unconstrained. If p is in between 4 thirds q and 2q, um, or even lower than uh, 4 thirds q, but with an electoral advantage for party A, then uh, we're in a partial capacity regime in which W is still one, so A gets all the benefits, but the scale now is Q times V. So we're going to be on that threshold between equilibria in our analysis. And finally, if P is actually lower than four thirds Q, we're going, and the party A is electorally disadvantaged, we're going to be in the constraint capacity regime where um, the uh, W is said to be less than one, so A compromises, and S um, is less than, um, uh, than previous, so it's VP over two times some, uh, some fraction. So this is how it looks graphically, like the equilibrium um, S is on the right and the equilibrium W is on the left as a function of P. Um, with, when P is small, when capacity is small, both of these um, are um, increasing um, in the regime in which party A is electorally disadvantaged up until uh, W reaches one. Um, and similarly, the scale is increasing in P um, up until um, it kind of reaches after 2Q, it reaches the, the unconstrained um, result from the benchmark with no transitions. What we show here um, when we compare these results with the benchmarks and the, the benchmark with no transitions is in red with the dashed line, the social planners benchmark is in green, is that what we get is this region where there's compromising, but that requires low capacity. That's the only case in which A will compromise. We have a region of overscaling for S, which is the region where capacity is intermediate, and that is when the scale chosen by A is higher than in either benchmark. And then we have this region where A is unconstrained. Um, and so what, why do we get this? Well, the effect of capacity is that it changes the opportunity cost of revisions, of delaying the project. Um, and also it changes the cost of scaling up the project for politician A. So when the capacity is high, the opportunity cost of delays is high and the cost of scaling up is low and politician A can choose this unconstrained solution. When capacity is intermediate, however, the opportunity cost of delays decreases because even if you continue the project, the probability is not that high that it's gonna move forward. So politician A has to make the scale large enough to avoid revisions by B. And this is why we end up with a scale even larger than the benchmark of, of the dictator A. 
When capacity is low, however, the opportunity cost of delays is low, but, but um, and the cost of scaling up is high, so that now A cannot just scale up the project a lot to discourage revisions. A also has to compromise on the division of payoffs um, and it's in order to discourage B from revising. So that gets us to a more equal project than, than before. So capacity B here, capacity P here determines both the equilibrium regime, one of these three regions, as well as within its region, it makes the, the equilibrium scale go up weekly at least. The effect of Q is non-monotone in that in the constrained capacity regime, that's when uh, both S and W are interior, they both decrease in Q because in this regime, A must compromise more as revisions are less costly uh, for B and, and, and increasing scale is costlier for A. Whereas in the partial capacity regime, um, S uh, star, the equilibrium scale, is also increasing in Q rather than decreasing. Uh, because in this regime, A has enough capacity to increase scale and deter revisions. And, and so um, having uh, a higher probability of revision success means that you want to deter it even more by a higher scale. And finally, this transition advantage versus disadvantage um, matters in that whenever party A is electorally disadvantaged, uh, disadvantaged, it can moderate in that um, it will select a more equal division of payoffs. Um, so let me uh, conclude now with a, a couple of two more things to say before, before I stop, which is one uh, kind of summarizing this result on the equilibrium scale is that um, this scale um, is higher than um, the social planners benchmark and potentially higher than the uh, benchmark with a dictator. And so we get projects that are overscaled and unequally divided in equilibrium. Um, and so what does this mean in terms of the message here for how capacity matters? Well, the direct concern about bureaucratic capacity is that it's making project completion faster and more efficient. And so generally we say that we want bureaucracies to have more capacity. However, what we want to show in this project is that capacity itself feeds into these initial choices about project characteristics, such as the, the investment scale um, and the distribution of benefits. And higher capacity may actually facilitate more unequal projects and also oversized projects as politicians strategically oversize these projects to avoid revisions down the line. Um, and um, I'm happy to discuss in, in the 10 minutes that we have uh, what we're doing next, which is to think about revisions versus cancellations in a multi-phase project, uh, but I'm gonna skip that for now and, and conclude on time. Um, the, what we're showing here is a dynamic theory of the effects of organizational capacity on public policy. As I said, organizations with higher capacity are more likely to deliver results faster, but capacity can be wielded to create oversized and more unequal projects. And the implication for public policy here is that uh, we need to think about the impacts of capacity beyond its direct uh, impact of whether it moves projects faster or not to this um, impact on the actual uh, makeup of public policies, uh, which can have a significant impact um, beyond these direct effects of, of time to completion. Um, so thank you, and I'm, I'm happy to, to discuss this more now in the discussion also uh, in terms of the, the next steps for the project. Okay, thank you very much, Dana. Um, personally, I was thinking about the, the quitting thing uh, while you were talking, so I would like to see that. But if before we do that, maybe people have questions. Um, anybody, just unmute yourself. Okay, give it a second. Right, sounds like we have time for uh, looking at quitting. Um, Perfect. 
Yes, so so let me actually give you the idea of what we want to do with the with the quitting, which which is um, to, to note that what we had in the model that I presented so far is that once you start this thing, you have to complete it. And the only tool for the party B coming into power or, or party A coming again and in, back into power is to revise. However, people can also stop projects or quit projects. So the way we, we handle this is to think about uh, extending the model to uh, multiple phases. So instead of just having uh, going from stage D to stage E and then you complete and the game ends, assume now that the game doesn't end once you've reached stage uh, E, but rather at that point, you can restart, you can repeat the whole game one more time in a new stage. So you can think about it as, two cycles of budget allocations for the project. Um, and um, in between these two phases, the party in power has the possibility to not allocate the, the, the budget again, so to quit the project, to end the project. Um, so in order to make this not just like a two times repeating the same game, we also think about how you allocate uh, budgets over the two periods. So we're thinking about the situation where I make I make part of the project in period in in phase one, which is a scale of S zero with the same cost of of S squared, and then once I start the next phase, well, I only have to to complete the remaining investment. So the initial scale, the S minus the scale that I've already completed in the first phase. So I divide the entire project into two 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 chunks and I make the first chunk and then the second chunk and in between them I can cancel it. Um, and uh, so and that also means that well if I cancel it if I quit in between I can get a liquidation value of whatever I've done in that first phase. So some proportion phi of V is going to be determined in phase one and one minus phi the, the rest is going to come in phase two. Um, so what we do for this quitting is to think about the, the case in which with some probability psi, um, chi, uh, B is going to find some other thing to do with the budget. And so they're going to uh, quit um, and their outside option will be higher than continuing. Um, and so otherwise, B is going to continue the project. And what we ask is, well, does quitting has the same effect as revision on these initial choices of scale and division of benefits? And as before, how do capacity and institutional constraints distort investment? And the answer, the short answer to this is like, no, quitting doesn't have the same result as revisions or the same impact as revisions. And to, to give you a, a one minute summary of why, well, in the second phase, which we represent here in graphically in the right panel, um, and what I want you to focus in this panel is just the dashed line that actually gives us the uh, objective of uh, the politician in power at that point in, in choosing um, how much, uh, in, in choosing um, whether to, to uh, continue or not in the, in the phase. Um, and what we what we have here is the implication that um, once you're in the second stage, um, you have the same game that I described, so you're not going to revise. And so the, the scale that you choose in the second phase is, is chosen in the same way as, as I described. However, what happens in the first phase where you know that there's going to be potentially quitting in the first phase, as we show in the in the left panel here again, the dash line is the, the kind of equilibrium um, utility for the politician in power. What we show in, in this left panel is that the scale that you choose in the first phase is going to be smaller when there's this probability of quitting. And so it, the probability of quitting is going to discipline the the politician in power at the beginning, not to overscale projects as much, because the more you overscale it, the higher this cost of, of running it, um, and um, the more is going to be uh, likely that the, the next person, if the next person is in power at the end of the phase, they're going to cancel. Um, so quitting and, and revising actually um, kind of have very different effects. Um, whereas uh, revising it to overscaling, quitting can be can be a way to discipline this project. So that takes us into the implication that having multiple phases and multiple budget allocation stages uh, can be a good thing, um, at least for the initial characteristics of projects. 
And that was like my one minute summary of that. Okay. Um, does anybody have comments, questions? I have a question. Um, yes. So, oh, excellent. This is this slide implications for public policy. This is all framed in terms of this capacity, which is, I don't know, reduced form or, 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 or a kind of aggregate of, of many different things. But I was also thinking about sort of comparative statics in terms of political process of different solutions for the political process. And this is also reduced form to a large degree in the model. I was thinking, is there a way to kind of unpack this, uh, you know, what does the similar model like yours, but with that element slightly more elaborated, would tell us about a uh, political process? Is there any lesson from that on, on projects? That, that's a very good question. And and um, like one way to think about it is like, well, does the does the I guess the choice of project characteristics fit feed into the electoral probability of, or the probability of staying in power of, of one politician versus another. Um, and well, we I was were thinking more of a sort of the opposite way. So, so I don't know if this is the opposite way, but what are the different chances of projects being completed or the, or the timing, sorry, the, dura the duration it takes to complete the project depending on the, the how the political process is organized. But I, can, I guess these two things can can feed each other. No, yeah, that's that, that's a, that's a really good point. And I, I um, we we kind of started with this one one very um, reduced form transition between people in power, um, and it's something that that uh, we have on the list to think more about <laughs> and to think more about how we can introduce that into this uh, into this model and keep the analysis. Uh, tractable, given that now we need to have this political process be, we reduce this so that we can actually analyze how this Markov process unfolds. Um, but it's a really good point about how, how to, to do more to put in more of a feedback between political process and, and characteristics. Mean, one, one idea that, that sort of was in the background here, I had in, in the background is, you know, in some, you know, there's this antagonistic, you know, two party system in which you have those switching and then there's this alternative in which there is a sort of more of a coalition building. And there is opposition and, and, and mm. coalition in government, but still it, it's, it's um, in the political process, it's not clear who is going to end up in the coalition once the results are in. So, so this kind of dichotomy. But anyway, this is more speculative. Sorry. Yeah, no, this is a this is a very good question. Actually, it, it feeds back into what I promised Francesco I would answer at the end, which is this idea of choosing W as you go along. And it has the same idea of like, well, can I can I compromise or negotiate the coalition with you by giving you some W or changing W as we go along? And well, I, I guess you can see once you've seen how we've done the project, uh, how we've done the, the model, why we didn't choose to do that or why why doing that would like kill our uh, our approach here. Um, so we, it's definitely something that we we consciously chose to have this to, to not have this bargaining every period um, in order to to think about this initial design of the project. Um, but it's definitely something that we need to 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 think some more about how to how to think about this the kind of bargaining coalition formation changing V over time if we can do that or maybe in between phases as as we have now multiple phases. Um, I don't know if Mike has has more thoughts on on this, uh, given that I'm, I'm only speculating here on, on what could be done and why we, we and, and why we haven't done it. I, I don't have an additional thought, um, but maybe just um, an observation, which is that um, I, I think that in some ways what we're doing is um, uh, kind, kind of a lame at, uh, attempt at answering your question, which is uh, if you were to look at existing models of capacity, I, I think in some ways they're, they're too reductive about politics. And part of what we're trying to do is to bring some politics, even in a limited way, uh, into, into the picture. Um, so maybe that doesn't satisfactorily address, you know, um, um, the, the sort of bare nature of politics in the model, but I do think that we, we are sort of pushing the, <laughs> uh, pushing the discussion forward a little bit. Um, and, and really, if, if you, 
uh, if you're not immersed in this literature, I mean, one of the reasons I was interested in this project was I felt like I was just hearing the term capacity thrown around a lot. And when you sort of ask people what it means, it's always this thing that is just really good for everyone, right? Almost as if it doesn't interact with politics at all. It's almost like it's a valence good or something like that. And, um, um, and so in some ways we were sort of um, asking your question of that literature, but uh, it's, it's very much worthwhile, I think, to uh, keep, keep going in that direction. Um, can I, uh, I think we could stop the recording here. I think the,